Okay, we are here with Val Librarian touring the 3D in Music exhibit in the Second Life 19th Birthday Exposition. You mentioned that you'd been here uh, with some tour groups and things. Uh, what what did you notice that their comments were? Uh, people really had fun moving about and playing, and you could hear. And what was fun coming with a group is there was a lot of sound going on. Someone would be doing some drum beats over here and notes over here and conversation in the in the local chat talking about the musical concepts. So it was just a lot of different interaction and playfulness going on. And then when I came by myself, I could dig into the different posters that you've got and the layout of it. And so it was it was really two different ways of, um, of looking at um, the music in 3D alone and together. So let's get started over here, Val, over what I call the circle and the line exhibit. On this placard, there is a black circle and a horizontal line and yes. about half, uh, above our heads. And along the bottom, go ahead and click. Uh, you'll notice there's an orange rectangle and below it, there's a white rectangle. Click the white rectangle just below the orange rectangle. There you go. Now, in musical parlance, that is C, or the root. Um, and you'll notice that the bottom is color-coded like a regular black and white piano keys. And if you march your way up there, try it. The white, black, white, black, white, white. Just march up a couple notes. Now, Go ahead and do the same thing starting in the orange note that you used earlier and just only go across the top row, the top row starting on the orange note. There you go. So orange to orange is a full octave. Now do the same thing but only go on the bottom row. And most people can hear that those two scales are different, and in music they're called the minor major scales, and they're famous because minor is somber, sad, strong, poignant, and major is cheerful, light, happy, vibrant type of thing. But if you look at the black and white keys, you wouldn't know which ones to play unless you took piano lessons like a, my kids did. But if you use the top and bottom rows, which are, by the way, color coded, right. then then you start to have a clue. But So that's the line. That's the line part. We're taking the line of the piano keys and we're color coding them. But the second thing we're doing is notice that the circles above, we've taken the black and white keys and bent them into a circle. So on the top left black and white uh, circle, click the top left white key and go clockwise around. Okay, C clicking all the keys or just the white ones? Uh, in, in a row, black or white, black, white, black, white, black. Got it, okay. Right. And the only trouble with rolling in a circle is you can't go that octave C anymore. On the line, you see you have a lower orange and an upper orange. Now on the right-hand side, start on the orange at the top and go around the circle again. There you go. Same deal. You can't go to the high orange because when you roll it in a circle, you'd, it would have to come out at you, which we could do in 3D. We could make the come out at us like a spiral or something, but that might be a little bit overkill. Now, the cool thing about this in terms of music theory is the bottom row, there are 12 tones on every piano, and then they repeat every octave. But you'll notice that the color keys, there's only 10. So there's something funny going on. There's only 10. So that's the first thing to look at. Now let's come over in the middle. And I like to call this exhibit the tower. Um, the, the 
the annotation is musical notes come from multiplying vibrations and whatever note you play on a piano it, it's in a frequency it's like so many beats per second like um in the orchestra every the oboe plays what's called a440 which is 440 beats per second and all the other instruments play now on this tower if you'll click the the red 900 click the 900 at the top near the top da. so da. that's the a that's what the oboe plays but the first note you heard was that good old c that you were playing over there on the left so in music theory every note is a number from 0 to 12, uh, 1100 and 1200 is at the top in singing from medieval ages every note has its own name uh, have you seen the sound of music i'm sure yes so yes. you you know the do re mi song oh yes mm -hmm. well on the right hand side click the do at the bottom which is the blue and then click the kind of the purple red ray r e and then the red m i me and that's your do re mi scale what i didn't know was that those medieval singers had a syllable for every note so click the little lime green D, D-I, near the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then the, the turquoise ma, M-A. So on a regular P-board, those are black notes. But in the solfage system, they're called do, di, re, ma, mi, fa, fi, sol. So Julie Anders had it easy because she only had to sing seven of them. But there are 12 in all. So music comes from multiplying vibrations, and like I said, every one of those platters in the tower, when you go from 0 to 100, there's a frequency behind that. Or at 900, it happens to be A440, and if you multiply that frequency by 1.014, it'll give you the 1000. And if you multiply the frequency at, at uh, K, it'll give you T. And you may or may not have heard that human beings see and hear and perceive things logarithmically so everything's multiplied the way we hear is multiplied and the way we see is multiplied and it turns out you take any note and multiply it by the 12 through to 2 12 times and you'll get a perfect octave so go ahead and click the 1200 the last platter at the top and they sound like the same note right right so it turns out that is universal to human hearing across the world and then if you click the purple soul number 700 uh, some people call that the the witch's castle the but that interval is also used universally in almost all systems of music from hindu music japanese music and american so I call that the tower. Mm -hmm. So this is a custom scale. It's not the same as the one we looked at over back on the left-hand side. This is not Julie Andrew. This is a scale that starts on A flat. Go ahead and click the orange here. Now if you come over to this scale over here and click an orange note on the left-hand side, so these scales are not orange is not the same note and the only point I'm trying to make is that these are color-coded for different scales that I compose in and over here where it says anatomy of a scale oops if you look at this here's the thing that's true about all of them the orange note is always the root or the ground groundy note the gray is always the neutral note that the witch's castle there's always a ground, there's always a neutral. And then we have the moody blues, which make it minor and major. And then we have the anxious pinks, which make it sound eh, eh. Remember when we played that lime green tea back on the tower, it was like eh, kind of uh, dissonant. 
and then there's this amazing green color that just floats. So those are the basic energies that I've discovered working with all this. The ground, the neutral, the urge, the mood, and the float. So that's that's the use case of creating custom scales for music. If you zoom in on the top picture here, you'll see a, on the left a, a split screen. I know you like to use split screens. The music composition app that I use is shown on the left-hand side and the color-coded piano kit that I'm using sitting there in Kitely. Uh, you'll see the orange, blue, pink, green, and gray. So every scale has those colors, um, but in different arrangements. Yes, I love that it's uh, theory in 3D, so you can visualize it so much better than just um, trying to understand the mathematical components, you know, in the abstract of your brain. This is another composition over here on the right-hand side, and I split it up. At the bottom left is a very dark blue cube in the first stack. Go ahead and click that dark blue cube at the bottom left. And what you're hearing is a, a melody, um, but it, now go ahead and click the pink second from the top. They're the same notes, but they sound so different. There's a, it's basically a French horn at the bottom, which is blatty and low, and, and you hear it in movies. And then the up, the pink is called a sweep synthesizer, which when you play it, it's going soft, loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft, loud. Now try the, the dark green, second from the bottom. And you think, what's with that? It's just the same note. Yeah, it's a very low bassy sound, but so what? <clears throat> but when I started to make animations of the music, I needed to have something that would make the visual background shimmer. <clears throat> and, that, and what I was finding out was that, that that horn was too violent. It was like shaking the screen. I just wanted a quiet shimmer in the background. So that contrabass there was perfect as a sound driver for a color screen. Plus, all good music has a, a foundation underneath it. You can, you know, the bass is playing in a jazz piece or the, and if you're like orchestra, you're, there's the big bass section. Now play the very light blue at the top left. So again, we're throwing a different timbre, which is just French for a voice or sound. Uh, it, this is basically an ocarina but it's playing three notes at the same time and over at the tower we are only hearing two notes at the same time when you put a stack of two on a stack of two it just the brain goes bananas uh, hearing patterns within it and then uh, go ahead and click the yellow one Those are the same notes you just heard on the ocarina a minute ago, but now they're spread out in time. And I got an insight about horizontal harmony, which is the yellow, and vertical harmony, which is the blue, light blue. So now I'm going to hear it all put together at the very, very top. There's a dark gray cube. If you click that. And don't click it now, but the whole composition is about um, like several minutes long. And at the very top, 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 there's the, the sheet music. There is actually a YouTube link. So that's kind of in a nutshell. Uh, again, I was trying to demonstrate uh, using 3D, interactive 3D for those who work with virtual environment app, custom pitch scales for composing, cross-dimensional thinking, combining two or more things together, like the music app and 3D. Uh, for teamwork and collaboration, you and I were clicking on things together and uh, fundamentals of music theory. And one of my favorite YouTube bloggers just says, you know, music theory is just the recipe box. And you write down the recipe, then you flip through it. What do I work on next? It's just a set of ideas to use for something that sounds cool. 
Well, I think this is a fabulous demonstration of how you can learn and teach in virtual worlds. Because I couldn't do this in the physical world the way that you've done it here. And I can dig deep into music theory in this new and interactive way. Um, and I, I feel like you really demonstrated the math in it, the mathematics behind it clearly, but playfully. And what I really like is that I get to interact myself. You know, it's not like just listening to a lecture. You get to do it and play around with it, as well as um, I like how I could visualize some difficult abstract concepts, but you've laid them out visually. So it's like it just makes sense. Well, Val, you and I are working with John O'Connor and Murat Gomez and others on a paper about uh, the metaverse and higher education. Many of the principles of pedagogy, of effective teaching, apply in all three environments. What are the things that can be done in a 3D app as a group in higher education that you can't do the other way as effectively? What makes it effective that can't be done in other places? Two things come to mind, and the first one as you're asking that question is that when you're in an immersive environment, it is so much more active than passive. When you're in a virtual world, you're in it, you're moving around, you're setting that pace. You're, and, and whether it's alone or together, when it, collaboratively, as you were a asking this question, I was actively engaged. It's very active in a virtual world. The second thing is the challenge level. When you, all of this material that I'm immersed in here about music, it's, it's challenging my thinking. There are things you can do in a virtual world that are impossible to simulate in the physical world, which brings its own um, cool, innovative ways to think and interact, but it also brings challenges to your brain. So that it has to do with that active engagement, and you have to learn how to think a little differently in order to do that, in order to not be overwhelmed by things that you can't do in the, in the physical world, and still learn to balance that pace. That state of flow to me is a balance between tension of learning something really challenging and new and relaxation of just being in the flow of it. Um, and that, that can happen in a virtual environment when the, the person who has created the simulation has, has thought that out ahead of time. Now, good teachers have always known this, but when you're teaching in a virtual world, you have a you have a whole new toolbox. You've toured this exposition, this Second Life 19th Birthday Expedition, which is filled with examples of 3D and interactive 3D uh, for, for many different purposes and use cases. Um, I'm hypothesizing that one thing that a 3D environment can provide that cannot be provided uh, is a combination if, if, you have to be able to build your own stuff, which you can do in Second Life. Everything here around us, I, I created using the in-world building tool. You can, you can build directly here in, in this virtual environment app. And you can do something as simple as a, a stack of platters like I did here. Or if you looked behind me, there's this hanging glorious moon with wind chimes thingy floating in the air. But if you're going to do some kind of higher education, I think creating in 3D is stretching the brain somehow in a, in a good way. So a 3D app would make sense for that, but you also have to be able to create there. You can't just tour, I feel, this exposition and say, wow, now I feel smarter. I think you have to actually build something. Now in the classes you and I have been giving talks to as guest speakers, they are actually required to build things. So is there something fundamentally different about them having to build in 3D that somehow relates to higher education, higher education purposes that can't be done as effectively, except maybe, you know, in a studio in real life in a sculpting? Yes, and I think um, the way that I can relate to what you just said is 
um, as a librarian, books and reading has always been an important part of my field. And I found that reading and writing are connected, just like breathing. You both breathe in, you inhale, and you exhale. Now, would if, if you were going to teach breathing, would you do one semester where all you do is breathe in and then wait till next semester to exhale? No, you would die. You know, we both intake and we ex exhale. We in inhale, exhale. Same thing with reading and writing. You don't just read, 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 read forever. You also need to learn how to express. We listen, we speak, we read, we write. We go in, in a virtual world to these places, but we too can build. And that's why I love the idea of symbolic modeling, where you build in 3D a representation of your thinking. You don't even know where that's leading until you do it. You know? And it's very, it's, I think that is one of the powers of virtual world. You can just build something simple yourself and it helps you dig into your thinking. This placard here that was my intro placard for the first I know I rec I recognized it. <laughs> this model for those watching it show it was called sieves and sliders and Val facilitated a symbolic modeling presentation in Second Life a year or two ago. I was thinking out loud how to talk about the idea of combining tools. It was a a, a pure metaphor uh, but it was getting me to think about my presentation from a whole new angle and I couldn't have done it if I weren't in, in a virtual environment app where I created that blue circle, I created those yellow rods, I created the slider. So the symbolic modeling is, a have personally found a powerful technique. I sketch a lot on paper and I sketch on the whiteboard, that's 2D sketching, but being able to um, look behind what you're sketching and look at it, and I it was even taught mechanical drawing in, in school, but if you can actually move the camera, which you can in Second Life, I'll just do it right now and swivel around and look up, down, and all around while you're building. Now, some people say, well, you can do that in CAD CAM, but I would argue the difference here is you couldn't do that interactively standing next to Val, librarian. And being together in it helps us dig into what it means better than when you're by yourself and you just were to make something in 3D and no one's with you. It's like there, there's a layer of learning missing there it, when you learn in isolation. Uh, the fact that you can build it together and get inside of it together is a whole new way of thinking.